Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it's the last talk before lunch, so I'll try to be quick. So, my name is Costanza, and I work for the Swarm Foundation, um, a decentralized storage solution. So, um, before I start, um, some disclaimers. So, first of all, we're going to be talking about extreme violence, genocide, and blasphemy. So, if you're not comfortable or for whatever reason you feel like you want to leave the room, that's totally fine with me. Um, second of all, I'm not a lawyer, and this talk is not legal advice. And finally, whatever I'm saying is my personal view, and I do not represent any organizations that I am or I was affiliated with. So, we can start. We're going to see the interplay between censorship and freedom of speech, how those elements come into play when it comes to censoring a crypto project. And to do so, we're going to look at the three elements of censorship. Law, and how law is a tool for censorship, governments, and institutions. And to do so, we're going to see the spectrum between censorship and freedom of speech, and what we can do to prevent a project from being censored today. So I guess everyone here is for freedom of speech. So the question is, where would you draw the line for freedom of speech? Are you okay with willingly insult someone? Um, as a matter of fact, I am. And in fact, um, this is a cartoon made by my father um, when the Pope said that God was a little bit like mom, a little bit like dad. So, now, what is freedom of speech? According to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, everyone has the right to the freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions, without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. Now, yes, the United Nations is a very Western-centric institution, so we might like, need to cherry-pick what we take from them, but I like this article because it's very comprehensive. Now, question is, shall we draw a line at some point? Um, if, you could, if you could go back to Rwanda in 1994, where the radio was promoting the genocide, would you try to stop it? If you could go back and uh, stop Hitler's propaganda, would you do that? Because those are the real questions, and those are the questions that, those are the elements that governments use today to say that they should be able to censor any form of media and technology in order to prevent those cases. Um, but on the other hand, like, um, was like today we can transfer tornado cash because it's promoting terrorists and money laundering. Tomorrow, only fans because it's immoral. And how long it goes before we end up in a hands mail tail reality? It, it's a very fine line, so you can stop it, in my opinion. So here, what do the US, Iran, Plato, and the Bible have in common? Anybody knows? They all, in a way, are in favor of censorship. The US and Iran, they both stopped tornado cash and many more. Plato, it was all for censoring um, the speech to prevent patricide. And the Bible, it says that you shall not name the name of your Lord in vain. This is because censorship is not something from a particular culture or a time, but it is as old as the history of humankind. Everyone is doing it, everyone has been doing it. So here today, we're going to talk about the actions that are being taken to prevent people from using software. Analyzing censorship as a whole might be a bit too complex, and we only have 25 minutes, so... We're going to focus on that use case. Now, we're going to see the three elements that are affecting projects and people. We're going to see the law, we're going to see governments, 
and institutions, and how those come into play to prevent people from using software. So, first of all, low. Uh, this guy here is Malinowski, and he's the father of modern anthropology. And he's saying that in looking for law and legal forces, we shall try merely to discover the rules acted upon as binding obligations, because no society can work in an efficient manner unless the law is being obeyed spontaneously and willingly. And I really like this way of seeing things, because it's very practical and very hands-on. So there are three elements in what he said. First of all, violating the rules can mean the end of an institution. The final end of law is the preservation of society, and laws should be obeyed willingly and spontaneously. And this is very important, and we will see why and how it comes into play. And now the question is, what happens if we don't do that? And what does willingly and spontaneously mean? So we're going to see that. Um, so, for example, Plato, he was saying that it should control the speech of people, otherwise they were not going to tell tales about the gods and the fathers, and children would end up killing their fathers and their families. So, according to Plato, we need the censorship to prevent pratricide. Now, another element is that tech goes faster than the law. Uh, there is no way of telling it, like, let's be honest, um, technology is way faster than the law, and it takes time to catch up. And that is good, because it means that everything that's illegal is legal, unless you're in Italy, but that's another matter. Uh, but that also means that crypto projects exist in a gray area. And I think that that is good, because it gives us a lot of freedom. Um, but also something important is that law is not exactly a smart code. It's not like you kill someone, you go to jail. It's like way more nuanced, so it's not that simple, and it's not that straightforward. And this is because there are governments that come into play. Like we said before that governments say that they need to be able to censor in order to save society from terrorism, from money laundering, from you name it, like anything dangerous, they need to be able to control it so that they can save us. Um, is that the case? Uh, let's play a game and let's get out of this amazing bubble here. And we step into the shoes of a fictional government official, Simon Skinner, we should all know it. And so we heard of like all those crypto things. Uh, um, those are like cyberpunk, uh, lunar punk, solar punks, uh, uh, the preacher of freedom from central governments. Uh, uh, they want to be borderless. They want privacy. They want to be anonymous. Uh, um, they don't want anyone to control them. How can there like, be a society if nobody's controlling it? How can there be a society without central governments? How can there be a society if there is no central authority? So we are scared. I mean, come on, like, like saying that we don't need to exist. So we don't understand what's happening. We don't understand all those crypto, Web3 people, uh, those shadowy supercoders, uh, and we are afraid that what we're doing might be irrelevant, that they might get out of job. So what do we do in that case? We fly, fright, or freeze. So we cannot go to Mars. So we need to stop it, and we transfer the projects. And this is why governments come into play and why they try to stop, to stop us. Now, we saw the law, we saw the government. Let's get into our institutions. And this is because as much as we're trying to break from that, we gotta be honest, and we do have institutions in crypto. Um, as of today, unfortunately, we rely on centralized infrastructures. 
um, on code repositories that are being centralized. And we rely on central RPCs that, again, can stop people because they are in the wrong country. They have the wrong IP address uh, or because they use a VPN. And so we need to stop them. And they can do that. So those centralized infrastructures are crypto institutions. We might like it or not, but we do have institutions today. So this is because institutions are structured, are created to carry out specific functions, and have a set of rules that govern their behaviors. And this is the same for all the institutions, including the one that we do have today in crypto. So we're going to see how that works in practice. Um, now, freedom and censorship is not like black and white. It is a wide spectrum. And on the extreme left of the spectrum, you have, yeah, that's left for you. Um, we have total freedom. On the extreme light of the spectrum, you have censorship. Now, um, let's go into a fictional society. And um, on the one hand, we have no compliance. We have overcompliance, where we go beyond merely and willingly obeying the law. And we have perfect compliance, which is what the law is kind of asking us to do. Now, here, in perfect compliance, we have a dual class citizens. And this is being forced by the governments. We have people that can use the software and people that can't use the software. Now, who belongs to each class is decided by the governments. And this is where you perfectly respect the law. When those centralized institutions are being very precise and are enforcing what they're being told. The thing is that sometimes they go beyond that. And they go beyond obeying willingly and spontaneously. They go the extra mile. And so they transfer people for reasons that we don't understand. And in this case, we have a dual class citizens. And it is being enforced by infrastructure players. The institutions, some crypto institutions, they are being the enforcement branch of governments as of the day. And then on the extreme left, we have the non-compliance. And this is a very risky spot, because if you're here, then what you're doing might be considered illegal. You might be prosecuted. You might, your court might shut down. You might be jailed. As we all know, apparently, unfortunately, it's happening. And you're here. Bottom line, the thing is that it should be your choice. It should not depend on a centralized crypto institutions, uh, whether you are in this spot or in the previous spot or in the previous one. It should be you. It's your code. It's your life. It should be your responsibility and your choice. Now, the question to ask to know if your project is going to be censored is how much does the fictional government official feel that you are threatening them? Are you posing a risk? Are you really being that dangerous for them? How do they feel about you? Like the person, I'm not asking about the institution. I'm asking about the person that can take an action against you. Do they understand you? Do they feel that you are somewhat a wild card? And then, what is the risk appetite of the centralized platform that you rely on? Because also them, unfortunately, come into play as they can enforce and stop your code. So if you answer those two questions, you might have a framework on what happens. Now, I'm optimistic because I'm seeing more and more projects coming out and trying to work around that to overcome all the, all the issues that are decentralizing. So for example, Ethereum blocks being transferred are way in decline. And while one block is one to many, let's be optimistic and let's see the pattern coming. 
And then also, we do have um, tools to replace the current infrastructure. So we should decentralize everything so that we can be stopped. And finally, and this is legal advice, get yourself a shadow super lawyer so that they can help you. Thank you. Thanks, Costanza, for the uh, overview. Um, is there any call, of, call to action that you want to maybe, like what sort of stuff would you want us to do and maybe like, what, do you, what do you envision as something that needs to be done? Still. I think that the first, thank you for the question. The first step is to analyze all the elements in your infrastructure from where you're storing the code uh, to the hardware to everything and make sure that every step, every single piece of your process is being decentralized so that you don't rely on the centralized inst platform, the centralized institutions that can block you. Uh, this is the first thing. The second thing is to protect the people that work for you because like we saw, they might just arrest you and decide that code is not speech and you shouldn't be doing that. So you need to find the legal framework to protect the people you're working for. And on that, everything is going very fast. So what happened last year, maybe today, will be different. Today, there are projects that are making sure, for example, that you can make your transaction anonymous without using Tornado Cash, for example. So protect your people. Protect every single element of your architecture. And Seriously, get a super cool lawyer. <clears throat> Yo, uh, who do you think have like bigger chances to stay out of, out of jail? Is that uh, Alexei Bertsev or Sam Bankman Fried of FTX? I, am, I can answer that question. I'm sorry. I don't right. have enough knowledge to do that. Thank you. Um, you say you're optimistic. Uh, are you at all concerned that the presently dominant solutions to scale uh, uh, blockchain transactions in the form of uh, roll-ups um, seem to have left behind censorship resistance uh, technically and sometimes even as a goal? Um, if the end game of Ethereum is only having roll-up bridges, uh, where would that leave Tornado Cash? Can you rephrase it? I'm not sure I'm hearing very well from here. Um, so uh, are you concerned that currently how we're scaling uh, yeah. roll-ups is abandoning censorship resistance? And if all, tra if all transactions, if all smart contracts other than roll-up bridges in Ethereum were on layer twos, where would that leave something like Tornado Cash? That's a very interesting question. I haven't thought about that. Um, out of my brain, the good thing is that we don't have one roll-up, so we don't rely on a single solution. And anyway, the solution takes the security layer from Ethereum, so that is still ensuring censorship resistance um, in terms of, like you said, um, roll-ups. The main thing that was concerning me, but again, like the numbers are showing that it's going fine, is that not everyone is running a full node. I'm not, for example, and many people are relying on RPC, um, like in Fura, and that they have the power to uh, transfer transactions. Um, so, because the censorship happened on that level. Now, like, thankfully, like, even in Fura, is now decentralizing, so they're taking steps to make sure that they can do that. Because then again, like what they're saying, and it makes sense, is that if we don't comply with the law of the jurisdiction that we're based on, we need to shut down the shop. So on some level, I understand that they do that. And they're taking measures to ensure that they're decentralizing, so they can't censor anymore. 
So taking a step back and making sure that they can ensure transaction persistence in that way.